Hello and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr and we're coming to you from the Old Capitol Museum here on the central campus of the university. Very glad to have you all with us. Tonight we begin a four-part series in which we'll explore climate change and the challenge of sustainability through the complementary languages of science and art. The Crossroads Project is a unique and exciting endeavor that merges art and science in a reflection on the beauty, intricacy, and fragility of our planet. And it's also a call to action. And we're privileged to have a behind the scenes look at this collaborative project tonight with its creators. My guests in this segment are members of the Fry Street Quartet. The full quartet will be seen and heard in just a few minutes. Um, but the person who's here with us on stage is Rebecca McFall, violinist. Very nice to have you, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. Uh huh. And uh, Robert Davies is just next to me, physicist and educator at the Utah State University. Thank you for being here, Bob. Thank Rob. you. And Elizabeth Oaks, many people here in our area know Beth Oaks, <coughs> having been with my quartet for many, many years, and she's now the coordinator of the University of Iowa String Quartet Residency Program, and you really are responsible for bringing this project to campus, so thank you, Beth. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the, the first thing we need to do, of course, is define what the Crossroads Project is, how this all kind of came about. I had the chance to see the full performance of the Crossroads Project the other night, as did many uh, here in our area, and it's, a, I think, a very uh, moving and thought-provoking presentation. Rob, would you tell us what it is so people who have not heard of it before can have a better understanding of what we're trying to explain? Sure. It, uh, at its core, it's a, it's a communication project. Uh, and I had spent a, a number of, of years giving public lectures on climate change uh, and then evolving into sustainability science. And what I found was that uh, you can lay down the information quite logically and the science is quite compelling and, and an audience will follow it on an intellectual level. Um, but the nature of, of sort of, of, uh, of, of human beings and the nature of the risks that are associated with these things are such that it's, it's difficult to perceive them. And so uh, even though these risks are very large and really quite immediate, we, we have a hard time as humans perceiving that. And of course, uh, so I was looking for a way to try to communicate this information a little more viscerally. Mm -hmm. um, and immediately, uh, well, I have sort of powerful experiences with music, and in particular chamber music. Uh, the Fry Street Quartet is a resident string quartet at Utah State University, where I am as well. And so I approached the quartet with a notion to try to come up with a, a performance that does that, prevents uh, compelling information and compelling imagery, and then unleashing some very powerful music to give people a sort of a meditative space to, to better internalize and contextualize the information that, that they're hearing. Yeah, and so I, I called it a performance, which I think is what it actually is. You, uh, the quartet plays live, and uh, you as the narrator or the guide through this whole experience, um, uh, 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 what should I say, we're, we're looking at visual, uh, we have a visual experience at the same time that we have this wonderful music being played live. Uh, we have comments you've made before and afterwards, sometimes during these, um, these various elements that, that just, you know, trigger thinking in a brand new direction. It's, I think, a very uh, inspiring and sort of a little hard to describe, as you can yes. tell from, from my <laughs> description. It's a little hard to say exactly what it is, but I think it is very much like life because we don't have isolated individual experiences that are, that are um, completely unique to one discipline. Uh, right? Uh, Rebecca, tell us a little bit about how you feel about this whole project. Oh, um, I'm very close to this project and so thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I'll start with just a little bit of history. So Rob approached us with this, with just this notion, uh, the notion he just described. And, um, and I spoke to my colleagues about getting involved somehow. And we all were immediately wishing to do so and wishing to, to find a way to make our, our, our art form relevant to this topic that's, that's touching all of us. And so this was just a really exciting endeavor and it's become um, a, a sort of grand work that, that Rob has, is, has been the author of, is the author of, but we have, have been contributors um, alongside it. And we have the great fortune of working with other collaborators, too. You'll get to meet Laura Kaminsky in a little while, who wrote the centerpiece um, for the string quartet of this work, and, um, and visual artists as well who've contributed works that, that, um, 
that are adding a lot to it. But the can our canvas, which has been, you know, the, the genre of the string quartet, has been busted open into all of these elements. And we were just talking about how sculpting the whole performance is a little bit like rehearsing a piece of music. You know, we'll, we'll do a rehearsal and think, oh, well, you know, it, there's too many endings. You know, <laughs> we need to streamline this, or we need to fade. Um, move from words to music more poetically so that the, the, uh, the audience person can have a through composed experience. Mm -hmm. So it's been fascinating on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. well, so we're going to go to some live music here in just a moment, but before that, I'd like to talk to you, Beth, and just ask you how, how you learned about this project and decided this is something we should uh, expose to. Well, I had an outstanding school. contact, which is Rebecca. <laughs> and I remember it actually really vividly. We were um, playing chamber music together, and we had a, a moment where we were sharing a meal together, I believe, and Becky said to me, she said, you know, I'm working on this project, and, and I just, she, she was a little tentative about it, approaching me, and she said, I, I wonder what you think, and she started talking about it, and I said, you've got to tell me more about this, this is incredible, <laughs> you know, and I mean, I, I have certain personal biases in this direction, my father's a physicist, so I definitely grew up in a, in a house that was infused with physics, and, and sustainability is definitely an important conversation topic in our house, but here we've got the medium of the string quartet, which had been my personal voice for 22 years, and, and so the more she talked about it, the more I just thought, this is a perfect thing for our campus and especially you know as somebody in chamber music who's a collaborator um, and that's so so important when you come to a university campus all of a sudden you have access to all these disciplines mm -hmm. and you're looking for ways to bring them together and to create a sort of larger sense of collaboration and to me what this project really embodied was how those collaborative efforts can come together to really try to affect change so it just seemed like too good an opportunity to yeah. miss and also Brad Otteson who's the violist did study here with um, Bill Prusel and the Prusel School so there was a personal connection here as yeah. well. Terrific. Well, I, I wonder, uh, this would be a good time for us to describe a l uh, this piece you're going to play, how it fits into the overall performance, for, perhaps, and then uh, we'll invite your colleagues to come up and, and hear a bit. Wonderful. We're, we're, we'd like to perform the first movement of Laura Kaminsky's string quartet called Rising Tide. And the first movement is entitled The Source of Life, and it is the, the meditative space for the water segment of the work. Okay. Wonderful, great. So as they all get assembled here, I'll just repeat that the uh, composer's name is Laura Kaminsky, and we'll meet her in an upcoming uh, segment. And so this is part of Rising Tide, and you'll be listening to the Fry Street Quartet.
Oh, thank you very much. Absolutely wonderful. And I want to uh, read the names of everyone who's uh, part of the Fry Street Quartet. You have already read, uh, met Rebecca uh, McFall, who's here with us on stage, the violinist. But you also heard Robert Waters, violin, and uh, Bradley Otteson, viola, and Anne Francis Bayless, cello. And we look forward to the next segment, where I know you'll be playing again. So, you know, for, for me anyway, the music stands beautifully, independently, on its own, Absolutely. and, you know, thoughts may take you in one direction or another. But then, as an integrated part of this larger work, the Crossroads Project, let me go back to you, um, physicist and creator of this whole project. What does it mean to you when you hear this piece played? You know, that's a, I, I'd have to think about that. It, specifically, well, this brings just to mind so many uh, performances that we've given and the different reactions that we've had, but the, I think the, you know, the, the structure of the performance is a series of vignettes. Um, if the premise is that we have really great sustainability problems, um, challenges that really carry with them very large risks, uh, certainly uh, both for our generation and very certainly for the next generation, the, that is sort of conveyed and explored in this performance by looking at first the way that natural systems work. And we've got that arranged in water and life and, and food, what we call forage, um, in those series of vignettes, so information and imagery, uh, after which then you sort of unleash the music on it. And, and um, so this is very early on in the performance when I, you just, for me, it just conjures up these big notions of, uh, of wonder of the natural world. And it's, it's been preceded by some very interesting information, I, I think, I hope, mm. about water and some, some quite beautiful images. Later on, that gets contrasted with human systems and why it is we're, we're in this uh, predicament that we're in. And it's uh, the premise of the performance is that you contrast how human systems work with natural systems and you find they're almost entirely antithetical. We, we do everything opposite to the way nature likes to do it. And so this is very early in the performance when it's very wondrous and wonderful. And later in the performance, uh, the final uh, vignette is called Societus, and that's a, that's a much heavier uh, 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 piece with more, maybe a little bit more violence, a little bit more uh, um, uh, argument in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I said earlier that in, in a way the piece impresses me as kind of a call to action. And um, what reaction do you get from audiences that that uh, hear the whole presentation and and you know are confronted by not only the beauty and wonder of the natural world, but then you know the the pickle we've gotten ourselves into. What, <laughs> you've, you've done this piece in Brazil, you've done it in, in other international locations, and you've done it here many places in the States. What kinds of reactions do you hear from audience members? 
Well, certainly there's a spectrum. Uh, but, but broadly, I think it's very powerful. It's not entirely pleasant. Uh, it's not really entertainment. We kind of call it performance science and, yeah. and performance yeah. art. Um, but we get very powerful reactions, contemplative. Often audiences coming right out of the experience, I think, don't, aren't quite ready to discuss what they mm -hmm. think. They're not quite sure what you feel. Um, and of course, ultimately, the, the intention is to provoke a, a meaningful response to these issues. And whether or not that happens is, remains to be seen. You have to see how long it sticks with uh, someone. But, but the initial reactions right, coming right out of a, of a, of a performance are typically quite, quite strong. And I don't know if Rebecca and Elizabeth want to. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you know, I'll just speak from my own personal experience as um, someone who went, my entire family went. And, and also we've had the privilege of having these guys on campus for a week so that we could, we did Crossroads early in the um, week intentionally so that we could kind of follow people's journey post Crossroads and see what their experiences were. And I, one theme I am seeing, and certainly was my experience and, and definitely my daughter's experience as well, is that and I, I think it's partly by the design. It's a very emotional experience. And so it penetrates you on a very deep level. And in some ways, it's hard to articulate. Yeah. And I think that's part of the power of it, actually, mm -hmm. is that you've, you've accessed, instead of just the intellectual side of it, where it's easy to kind of talk about it and um, have a conversation, you've triggered something much deeper. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we all kind of came, we came home and we, we decided on a family meeting. We're gonna have a family meeting after we've sat with us for a little while, and we're gonna make some changes, and we're all gonna discuss what they are individually and also as a family. And so I thought, well, that was our own personal experience. Um, I'm not sure what other people felt. And then I've gone into actually the classrooms, and a number of people have said the same thing. Like, they are sitting with that information. There are conversations that are happening. Everybody's digesting. I think that is the beauty in terms of how you guys have created this, and also, Rob, your, the way you sort of present the call to action at the end, which you might want to just mm -hmm. talk about, because I think that really, it gives individuals a, a space to think about what his or her own reaction is going mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. And you don't have an easy answer, and I, these are not easy problems to solve. Yeah but you create a space that we really think about it on a very, very deep level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you, exp uh, could you tell us how you kind of wrap it up? What, what is the charge you, you leave the audience with? Well, so uh, certainly we lay out the, uh, the litany of, of, um, of ills with our modern societal systems, and we organize it in systems of food and energy and economy and how each on their own are unsustainable. Um, and often when you talk about particularly climate change, it's, the, the thinking is that, well, this is about changing our energy system. It's about changing our technology. And, and when you look at the people who really study this uh, and model it, um, it's not really about our technology. We, we have the knowledge and the technology we, we need to address these issues. What, what we are lacking is the social technology, the way to sort of move ourselves uh, into a, a new path. And that's really about two things. It's about changing whole systems, uh, and not individually, but all together. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower had a great quote, which I'm going to uh, do a little bit of violence to. But basically, it said, if the problem is too big to be solved, make it bigger. And, um, and the idea is that in order to make the changes we need, we really need to make it at a full systems level, uh, all of our society at once. And it's not the technology so much. It's our approach to uh, our lives. Um, and this hyper-consumption that, that we've only recently fallen into. Um, you know, we know we can live very happily without this because we have in the past. In fact, you know, there's a piece of information in the performance that is over the last 50 years we've doubled our consumption uh, and our happiness by, by just about every measure that they track these things has gone down. So the final, uh, the final segment in the epilogue, we talk about this notion that it's very much about turning inward to ourselves and reassessing what we think of as happiness and what we think of as success, uh, and then turning that outward to reform our societal systems to reflect that. Because right now, our societal systems, I think, don't reflect who we really see ourselves to be. And we often don't notice that. Uh, and that's so what the performance does and certainly what the music does is the performance kind of brings in that message and the music, I think, quite amplifies that, that, that uh, feeling that, that people have. 
Well, I couldn't be more grateful to have you all, all here for this program, to meet you all, and um, to have enjoyed some of your residency myself. And, um, and many people who see this show, I'm sure, will, will uh, learn a lot from what they'll be hearing and what they've heard in this segment. So thank you so much, Rebecca McFall, Beth Oaks, and Rob Davies, also members of the Fry Street Quartet. Um, we hope you can stay with us for uh, the next segment in this uh, program, in which we'll meet the composer of this wonderful music, Laura Kaminsky, and have another uh, live performance. And uh, so uh, that's it for this segment. I'm Joan Kerr. This is World Canvas for international programs. All World Canvas programs are available on YouTube, iTunes, UITV, and also the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. So thanks for being here with us, and good night.